for this. So we are recording. Um, yeah, if you can type your first and last names into the chat box, please, I'd appreciate it. This is how I take attendance. I will have you do it again at the end of the webinar. So that way I can tell that, yes, you were here for the, for the whole time. And let's go on. So here is me and my family. So this is uh, my son's senior trip. He's now going to be a sophomore at ASU. And we took a family road trip up to the Four Corners area, did a bunch of the national parks up there. And this was at Mesa Verde uh, National Park, one I definitely recommend. It is a fantastic place to go and hike and see some amazing ruins as well. Um, my daughter is just a new graduate from the University of Arizona in triple major with Arabic, Middle Eastern, North African studies, and global studies. And she was supposed to be going to Morocco in a couple of weeks, but she's actually now, she'll leave in January to do a fellowship there with the State Department. And then my handsome husband is a public school teacher in Tempe Union High School District and teaches social studies as well. Um, so a little bit about me. I am the K-12 Social Studies and World and Native Languages Specialist here at the Department of Ed. I've taught public school for about 20 years and been with the agency for a year now. And I taught um, all grades seven through 12 and pretty much every subject that you possibly could think of with regards to social studies from co-taught to on level to AP and dual enrollment classes. I've taught government, econ, uh, world history and, uh, and US history. And I was very fortunate to be one of the 118 or so teachers that helped write the standards for two years uh, a couple of years back. So as I get to know you guys, I know you've put your names in the, the box, but just to get to know like kind of where you are, what grades you teach, and, and kind of where you're from, because I like to see when we get uh, teachers from all over the state um, kind of showing up. So I appreciate that um, in the chat box. And if you can make sure your chat box is assigned to everyone, and then um, we'll all be able to, to see it as we go. So we've got some Phoenix, second grade, fantastic, Queen Creek, third grade, sixth grade, middle school, SEI teacher from fourth grade, seventh grade from State League Junior, fantastic, Tucson, yay Tucson. Um, it was great, I, do, I, do, I did some trainings down there at TUSD and Sunnyside School District and it was great because it always gave me an uh, opportunity to go see my daughter when I was down there. So Miranda, nice to see you. We did that training with you guys a couple weeks Gosh, I guess it was more than that a few weeks ago. Uh, kindergarten, God bless you. That's amazing. I, I could not teach little kids. <laughs> that required way too much patience for me. And I am not good at making things look pretty and it's just not my forte, so. Fantastic, some fifth grade and sixth grade. Good, so a lot of like middle and um, elementary teachers. Fantastic. So we'll definitely gear that. I don't see a lot of high school teachers on our training today. So I'll definitely try to guilt, gear it more towards uh, middle and high school, but definitely there will be tons of resources out there for um, those of you that are high school teachers as well. So uh, let's see, let's move on here. So our agenda for today, we're going to really examine, and this is just kind of like if we, if you want to think of it a part one, I've been doing this webinar now for a while, and I think I want to develop kind of a part two that delves a little bit more into inquiry and making your own inquiries. Uh, but for right now, this is just kind of an introduction, if you want to think of it, to what is, is for a formal inquiry, and then to give you some examples of alternative inquiries um, that you can use and start to adapt into your classroom. So we're going to examine what it is. We'll review the key components of an inquiry examine how inquiry can be used in a social studies class, and then also learn how you can create your own inquiry. And the beautiful thing about a lot of these is that these resources are all open education resources, which means you can reuse them, you can edit them, you can mash them together, you can copy and print them, uh, you can put them online and do whatever you need to do that best suits your needs in the classroom. And, uh, make make it make it your own without any kind of problem. So real quick, I just wanna also now get a feel for kind of where you are with your knowledge of inquiry. So rate yourself a one, two, three, or four. So one is I know it and use it a lot. Two is I'm familiar with it and sometimes use it. Three, I know of it and have tried it. And four, I am unfamiliar with it. All right, so lots of twos and threes. 
couple of fours, which is good, no worries. Awesome. All right, good. So most of us are kind of at the two and three range. So hopefully when uh, at the end of this, I will kind of move you, move you up a level. That's kind of my goal for, for today. So if you don't know it, you'll feel familiar with it. If you do feel familiar with it, and sometimes you use it, you'll have that confidence to then go forward and use it, you know, as much as you can and almost in any every day make some little piece of your lesson um, inquiry. So to start off with, we're going to look at the formal inquiries. And that's what I had you guys um, go out to uh, the C3 teachers website and, and download like a formal inquiry or at least make yourself familiar with it. And that's what we're going to focus on for the first uh, three quarters of the the um, the webinar. Oh, and real quick, I just realized I need to give you guys kind of a fair warning. Um, the IT guy ended up messing with my computer because it was having some problems just before uh, the webinar and he installed a bunch of stuff. And so right now that's installing on my computer and he swears to me that I don't have to restart my computer <laughs> in the middle of all of this, that I can postpone it. But just on the off chance, if all of a sudden this gets totally wacko and my computer shuts down, I will log back in as quick as I can. Don't leave the meeting and I will get right back in and we'll start right back where we are. So just as a, a heads up, that may be a, a little glitch, but so far it looks like everything that's installing is still pending and working. So it may not need it until after we're done. So all right, back on track. What is inquiry design model? Inquiry design model is just one instructional method that combines your teacher knowledge and expertise with students doing the work. Um, and I, I liken it to just one tool in your toolbox. Um, it also should be part of an overall unit. So again, this is just one piece of the puzzle. You'll want to make sure that you, you keep things varied, that you don't necessarily just teach only using IDM. You wanna do multiple different things. And so again, this should be part of like a larger, larger unit that you have in your classrooms. It also focuses on that student-centered learning and engagement. And that's the part that I loved about teaching with this is that it took my knowledge and expertise, but yet I'm not doing the work. I, I'm doing the work behind the scenes, which you'll see, but in class. And now if your kids are online, your kids are doing that work and learning. And I found it to be so much more impactful because they are then now internalizing that, um, that work and, and that information and that knowledge as opposed to me just giving it to them and then thinking, oh, I just need to memorize it for the test and that's it. Another piece of inquiry design model is they always, the ones from the C3 framework, always provide you with an opportunity for extended civic engagement. So you can get kids involved, you can do service learning with it, uh, which is another fantastic way to kind of tie some kind of service to your teaching and that those are all provided with the C3 framework. What inquiry is not is a lesson plan. It definitely is much more in depth than that, but it's also not just a unit plan and it for certain is not a cure all for critical thinking. It's not this end all be all of like, you know, little baby angels singing hallelujah, like, oh my God, my kids are going to get it. It's just one piece of the puzzle and I have found it to be a really impactful piece as I've been, been teaching. Oh my gosh, my computer is doing something now. Oh, whoo. I had a little panic attack there for a second. All right, so let's, whoops, let's move on. So where can we find inquiry in the standards? For our new Arizona history and social science standards, they, you can find inquiry in the disciplinary skills and processes piece of it. So this would be part of the SP standards if you're looking at your one pagers or for the um, history people, I think these are the ones that start like after the, um, they're the, the disciplinary skills and processes. So I'm not sure what page they are. They might be on page 45. Uh, so what they look at is chronological reasoning, change and continuity over time, similarities and differences. Um, those are all inquiry skills that we're having kids work with. Um, you also have to compare and evaluate multiple perspectives, drawing conclusions about events, especially when there are multiple points of view is another big piece of um, inquiry. And we also see them in our standards where we are asking students to think like historians, think like geographers, think like um, economists, and think like 
political scientists. And that again is also in those disciplinary skills and processes. And then lastly, looking at cause and effect. And cause and effect is a big piece of our disciplinary skills and processes. So that's the big portion of inquiry that you see in the, in the standards. So what are the requirements for inquiry? And we're gonna go into these each a little bit more in depth. So first of all, an inquiry has two types of questions. It has a compelling question and it has a supporting question. And typically each inquiry has one compelling question and roughly three to four supporting questions. It also, they use, um, it uses primary and secondary sources that build upon um, the student's knowledge. <coughs> Excuse me. So it will be heavy with primary sources and you'll have kind of a sprinkling of secondary sources. So when you're using these, you definitely, or if you're creating your own and you start to feel comfortable doing that, definitely you wanna rely on primary sources first and foremost, and then use secondary sources to kind of corroborate what the kids are reading and finding in, primary, in the primary sources. Uh, inquiries are always both content and skills based. And so I found that a lot of teachers are really hesitant in thinking, well, if I'm not teaching and giving kids the content, how do they get it? You'd be surprised. They get the content. They get the you know, branches of government. They'll get um, the different uh, you know, economic concepts of scarcity and opportunity costs, right? They get those in addition to these historical thinking skills um, in these inquiries. The inquiries also include formative um, assessments, which are kind of tied to the supporting questions, a summative assessment, which then is tied to the compelling question, and then additional performance tasks and that extension of, of learning and kind of civic, um, civic engagement. And then often students will write in inquiries, but not exclusively to communicate cogently. Um, many times I think we overlook the idea that things like graphic organizers, infographics, um, timelines, and things like that can be really effective ways to assess our students and assess their learning where it doesn't have to be just writing. But don't get me wrong, they will be writing and writing a lot, which especially for those of you that are teaching elementary, this is a fantastic way where you can kind of double up and you're teaching social studies, but you're also teaching those reading and writing skills. So with inquiry, there are basically four steps to this type of learning. And the first step really evolve, um, evolves around the kids developing questions. And so as they're investigating and really using these primary sources, they start to ask questions and, and they want to then answer questions. And you'll find your students will be more engaged in rather than just, okay, you're giving them a PowerPoint and then they're having to kind of just answer, answer questions on it. So they internalize it more and it's tied to, tied to them more. Also, they research the topic using time in class. And this is the thing that I have found to be a little bit different focus from when I started teaching way back in the early 90s, is that I was the one that was like up in the classroom and I'm talking and I'm you know making sure the kids are on task and I'm walking around and monitoring them and I'm doing all this work during, during the class time. And with inquiry, it's kind of flipped where I do a lot of work on the back end, a lot of prep work, a lot of I need to make copies, I need to get these laminated or, or whatever it is where I'm doing work on the, the before my class, but then my class time is when my kids are really the ones that are doing the work. They're getting into the documents, they're investigating, they're researching what they're having to do and I'm standing back and again, monitoring and making sure they're kind of not getting too off, too off task or that sort of thing. You will find sometimes, especially when you have kids working together or doing these kind of inquiries, your class may be louder and it may look a little bit more chaotic than it normally would, but that's okay because that's the part of that learning, that, that process that's in there. Students also have to present what they, they've learned, and that can be a, a formal presentation where they're up in front of the class. It can be an infographic. It can be, you know, a podcast or a video that they record. It can be an old-fashioned poster board that they, you know, glue stuff to. They have to present, and I think that's one of the great things about social studies that is different from almost any other subject matter is that we have a unique opportunity to teach skill, 
those, some of those soft skills to students that will help them later in life, regardless of what they do. You know, how do you look someone in the eye? How do you present information with evidence and sound confident in your voice? How do you do, um, you know, stand up there and you don't fidget and you're not messing with your hands because you're having to present. Um, those are all things that as they get older, regardless of what field they go into, you know, they're going to at some point in time have to ask someone for something, whether it's a raise or whatever, they need to have some of those, those skills to, to do that. And then lastly, students are able to reflect on the work that they've done and really process what worked and didn't work and honestly come up with some more, more questions too. So for your IDMs, for your, for your inquiries that you guys looked up, there are really three phases to it. And I've got the template up here. And the first phase starts with framing the question or framing the inquiry. The second phase is filling in the inquiry. And the third phase is finishing the inquiry. And we're gonna get into these a little bit in depth. So let's start with framing the inquiry. So framing the inquiry starts with the content angle and coming up with that compelling question. And I will say it is much more difficult than what you would think. It's like, oh, I just need to come up with an open-ended question. You have to come up with an open-ended question that has multiple answers to it because again, you want the kids to do this investigation on their own. And you need to make sure that the primary sources that you are giving the kids have lead them to, you know, a certain kind of conclusion, but you know, you still want to leave that open for that, that gray area. Um, there are certain inquiry type questions that are just kind of non-negotiable. Like for example, you would never do an inquiry that would say, oh, um, you know, did the Holocaust occur? Yeah, that's not an inquiry. We all know it occurred. That's not something you, you would do. Um, however, maybe asking different questions of different perspectives of the Holocaust, like that would be perfectly acceptable. Or um, another example would be, oh, was slavery good? No, it wasn't. You know, some people may have benefited economically from slavery, but at no point in time should a compelling question be, was slavery a good? All right, so that's kind of what I'm, I'm giving a little fair warning there. The next step that goes with this, the filling in the question, is uh, really this is where you're working, where the students are doing the bulk of the work and they're supporting questions. They're using disciplinary sources, they're constructing arguments, they're finding evidence from sources, and each one of those, they're answering those little supporting questions almost in a scaffolded manner that then ties it back to that large overarching question. So let's look at these compelling um, and supporting questions. So again, compelling questions set that opening or that frame of the question. They're the large overarching umbrella question. They should be intellectually rigorous and relevant to the students. And then they set up that summative argument. Whatever your summative assessment should be, should be answered in that um, compelling question. The supporting questions contribute to the understanding of the compelling question, and they focus a lot of times on descriptions, definitions, and processes, and that's that knowledge, that's the content piece that kids are getting. So that's what you want to, to work on. And I kind of liken it to a, a tree. So your compelling question is this tree that has all these great answers and you know all the leaves on it and it's detailed, but yet if you don't have the root supporting the tree, then your tree falls over. So you've got to have those supporting questions to again, build up that background knowledge so that way the kids have it. And yes, absolutely, you will be getting a copy of this presentation. So it takes roughly, give me a week, um, to get the attendance entered. And then I will be, be emailing you guys a PDF of this and the PDF will have all of the hyperlinks to it. So that way you can have those as well. So you will be getting them um, within a week, roughly depending. All right, so I wanted to show you some examples from the C3 um, of what inquiries were. So I took a primary one, an intermediate grade one and a high school one. So, um, Oh, how do masks benefit community? That would be a great compelling question that would relate to today. I love it. Um, so what makes holidays special is a kindergarten question, right? Or it would be great for our kindergarten standards for those of you that teach it. Again, it's broad, it's open-ended. There's no right or wrong answer to it. And then if you look up at the top here, here are the three supporting questions that go with it. So first is what are holidays and traditions, right? We're defining what those holidays are. How are holidays celebrated with traditions? And I think this is a great way, especially if you teach maybe with a high population of minorities, or even if you don't, and maybe you teach in a really 
maybe affluent, you know, predominantly white school. This is a great way to bring in some culture from other places too. Um, and then lastly, what symbols uh, uh, make us think of certain holidays. So again, that's that kind of background work, that scaffolding, the root system that then supports it. And by the time the kids work through those three questions with the sources, they should be able to answer that what makes holidays special. Um, what is the real cost of bananas? I love this one because especially this deals with economics. And for those of you that haven't been trained in economics, it's a, I, I found just as I've been going out, it's really scary. And I taught economics for five years, taught AP macro for five years. And unless you've taken an economics class, it can seem very intimidating to teach economics. I will show you a couple of resources where there are amazing lessons online um, that are really geared for K-6 teachers. Um, but again, you can do this inquiry on the real cost of bananas. Here are your supporting questions. Where do bananas come from? So you get some good geography in there. What do corporations in the banana industry contribute to society? What are fair trade bananas? And then what are the working conditions like for children in the banana industry? So again, this is a great way to um, bring in some of those economic concepts of scarcity, opportunity costs, whatever it is you may be looking at, um, the different kinds of markets, whatever it can be, um, that you're getting some econ in there and you're also doing you know, your, your social studies and stuff. And then the last one is why was the Korean War forgotten? So this is a great high school one um, or middle school one. And you've got your four supporting questions here of how did the Korean conflict become a war? What domestic concerns distracted Americans from the war? Did soldiers forget? And then how has US history forgotten? Um, this is a great inquiry. And also I want to encourage you that sometimes, you know, again, these can be part of an overarching lesson. And when I taught world history, I did not have a lot of time to get into the Korean War teaching world history. Um, so I would actually just use a couple of the supporting questions and do like two of the supporting question activities and I wouldn't do the whole inquiry. So don't be afraid to just cut and pick a couple things that may be working for you because I didn't have time to do the whole Korean War was forgotten thing in a world history class, but I still felt it was important as the Korean War being kind of like a, a turning point in the Cold War and I made a larger argument about that, how things changed. Um, and so I just did a couple, a couple of the supporting questions and, and that's all I did for it. And it worked out really well. So now let's talk about the primary and secondary sources that you need to use and that are included in the, the C3 inquiries. One thing that it, they do is they spark curiosity and kids get really involved, especially at the elementary level when you see pictures and things like that. And it's like, oh, well, what are these people doing? When was this picture taken? How do they look like me? How do they maybe not look like me? What's similar, what's different, all that kind of stuff. It also, again, the primary sources are what build the knowledge. So it's no longer you giving the kids those facts, they do get it. And I know that's a little scary at first and it was for me as well, because I think, God, are they really, really getting the content? If I'm not lecturing to them, they totally get it. And then also, this is what's great, is they learn how to argue with evidence. They have to actually use pieces of the primary and secondary sources as their evidence in their, their argumentation of what they're doing. So I also want to argue for variety being the spice of life. Vary up your primary sources, whether you're using an official C3 um, inquiry or not. Don't just use written documents. Use political cartoons use artifacts. Artifacts are great in pictures for, you know, primary and intermediate grades. You've got photos here of this little girl with the um, holding either a sibling or a young boy and you've got the tank behind her. I mean, it's a really powerful image to ask your kids, okay, what's going on? What's, you know, what, how do you feel when you look at this picture? And then for me, I only took one art history class in college, but I love going to museums and I'm a total museum nerd. I love using art in my social studies teaching. And I will use things like, for example, this picture down here at the bottom is the, is the mural of Guernica that Pablo Picasso um, painted after Guernica was bombed by the Germans in that interim period between World War I and World War II. And so I use this piece of art and I will show you kind of what I have my kids do a little bit later on. But I use this piece of art as a great way to teach, you know, what's going on and the kids are analyzing it. Plus it's subjecting them 
to uh, pieces of art that maybe they wouldn't see. Read alouds are fantastic, and that's a great way to read primary sources, especially to kids that maybe don't have that high of a reading level to read that primary source, like in your primary grades or something like that. So yes, definitely read alouds encourage that, that quite a bit. So, all right, looking at our inquiries, we have formative task examples. So these are the kinds of things that you can do with the supporting questions, right? So you can have kids define a term, easy peasy, right? Uh, you can also have them list and rank problems, reasons, or challenges, and key figures. And so I use this one a lot in my class, not just with inquiries, but you know you have those days where for whatever reason, or maybe you just have one of your classes that goes faster than the others, and you've got like five minutes to kill, and you're like, oh my god, what am I going to do? The bell's not going to ring yet. I would go out to the recycle bin, and I would take papers that had been printed on one side, but they were blank on the other side. And I would go and take them and cut them into squares. So I would get four squares out of a blank piece of paper. And I would pass out these squares to the kids. And I would just say, hey, here, here's the paper um, list of the 10 things we learned. You pick the five most important, put them in order, and then tell me why you put them in order. And so again, they're having to narrow it from 10 to five items. And then they have to justify the, the rank that they gave each, each item. That is huge and it's easy peasy and they totally, you know, it fills a few minutes if you need it. It could be an exit ticket. Um, and what's great is the kids are having to think and they're having to make an argument for their five pieces that they've listed and also back that up with evidence why they put this one here, that one there. Uh, you can have them annotate a source or a map, have them annotate a timeline, anything like that. Have them write on it pictures to, um, I have them do that as well. They can make a timeline. Many times I'll have my kids make a timeline and again, maybe they have like 10 events. I'll have them narrow it to eight. So again, now they're having to think a little bit deeper that, okay, we can only include eight events. Which do we leave out that aren't important? And then a lot of times I'll have them take one event that, okay, what's the turning point event? and then argue why you felt that event was the turning point in this timeline. You know, what was the most important piece? And you can even do this with little kids. You know, when you have them make a timeline of their lives, okay, what's happened, you know, first you started kindergarten, did you have a baby be born in your family? Um, you know, when did you start preschool? And, you know, have them make a timeline of their lives and then what's the most important? Again, they're having to think, they're having to inquire, and they're having to back that up with, with evidence, which is great. Um, a T-chart, a graphic organizer, Venn diagrams are all fantastic formative examples that go with supporting questions. And again, writing is the easy fallback on. You can have them write a paragraph for a formative test. You can even have them just write one or two sentences with some evidentiary support. I will have kids sometimes too, where maybe they've done a lot of investigation where they'll take maybe a complex event and they have to narrow it down like a tweet to just like, okay, in 10 words, summarize this one event. And so they really have to choose their words carefully, think about it and say, okay, what's the message we wanna get across? Cause we only have 10 words that we have to summarize this, you know, thing that we learned. And it's amazing how much they struggle with it. But then also if you pair them into groups and especially like in my co-taught classes where I may have kids with really low reading levels, it is a huge, huge help and they also can help in that. Um, formative task examples include like debates, uh, structured academic controversies, reader's theater, um, and again, developing that claim with evidentiary support. And as they get more sophisticated, have them make a counterclaim again with evidentiary support. So they're having to kind of think outside of the box that way. Um, so here's what I'd like to do. Here are our examples. I want you to, in the chat box, if you could for me, type which of the formative task examples I've given you, you think would be the easiest to implement in your classroom going forward. So a lot of developing claim, annotating, the race rank list one. I tell you, that was like my saving grace if I happened to talk fast one class period. I just kept a big old stack of those squares and I just would have kids pass them out and let's go, go for it. Charts, uh, debates, writing short paragraph, 
Fantastic. The 10 word summary thing, that's always so much fun. I, I like it because the kids really struggle with it because it's like, oh shoot, we have to get 10 words and I wouldn't let them do less. It had to be 10 words. So they really have to think as they're, they're doing their, their words. It was, it was a lot of fun. All right, so then the last part of our inquiry is actually finishing the inquiry. So this is where after we've staged the question and the compelling question, now you're actually in answering it. And so using everything that they've done here with their supporting questions, they've made their connections, they now finish that summative task and, and complete it that way. They also have the ability with the C3 ones that you guys have looked at where they can take informed action where it's like, okay, maybe, um, you know, for older kids, the Korean War one, for example, um, maybe you wanna have them look up and see if there's a local uh, Korean War vet group that maybe they want to uh, have somebody come and interview them and save their, save their, you know, as an oral history kind of thing, as an interview. I know um, there's an organization called the Korean War Legacy Foundation that has really tried to make an effort of, interviewing Korean War vets before they all pass away. My father-in-law is 92 and was in the Korean War, but stationed in Germany. And so, you know, those guys are getting older and, and the women that served as well, you know, behind the lines as nurses and doctors and all that kind of stuff. And so to really preserve that, but that would be a great way to extend that, extend, extend that action and, and get kids involved in the community that way. So some summative task examples to finish your inquiry up. You can obviously do the written essays you know, have them be open-ended, use that evidentiary support um, from the sources. You can do Socratic seminars and interviews, um, projects and portfolios, and multiple choice exams are great ways to do it too. But when you do multiple choice exams, think more along the lines of stimulus-based questions, where maybe you're going to take an excerpt of a primary source and then ask them that maybe they even read already before, and then have them look at that and then you know answer questions based on that. Yeah, the World War II vets are almost exclusively gone. And even the Korean War vets are, are really starting to um, pass. I know I went on a, they had like a tour where they took teachers to South Korea and they actually would fly Korean War vets to South Korea to come back and honor them. And it was this huge ceremony. I did it like two or three years ago. And unfortunately, just Korean War vets are even too old to travel to Korea. And so now they're trying to actually come to the United States and do some of that honoring of those um, vets here in the States. So yeah, uh, infographics are another great summative task example. And then you also may have benchmark exams or district, district exams through um, wherever you teach that those also can be um, used as part of your uh, summative examples too. So now we're going to kind of do the, uh, the part where I'm going to have you guys look. So if you haven't gotten out and looked at the standards, I will post it back here for those of you that maybe came late um, or if you don't have it here. I want you to go out and find an inquiry and pull up your standards for me. Let's see. So I just posted that in the chat again for you guys. And we're going to look at um, look at the different standards and, and what they are. So here are some disciplinary skills and processes for primary that all of these standards here hit um, hit your your inquiries. Um, here's some fifth grade standards, seventh grade standards, and then the high school disciplinary skills and processes. And I will tell you, we just did a third grade training and a fourth grade training this week, and I took a couple of inquiries from the C3 and. I think um, on average, they're between 12 and 15 standards that these inquiries, if you do a whole inquiry, will hit 12 to 15 of the standards. So here's the C3 website. If you haven't been out there yet, I definitely recommend you search by topic because this started as a grant, a federal grant to the state of New York to create these. And they've subsequently since opened it up. So you'll see some from Nebraska, Kentucky, um, I think Arkansas has put forth some. Arizona, we haven't submitted any yet. So we're in the process of maybe thinking of coming up with some great Arizona inquiries and posting them out there. But because different states teach um, different topics at different times, um, selecting by grade doesn't really, isn't really effective. I would say select by topic, and that's the, the best way to do it. 
So here's what I'm going to have you guys do. So I'm going to have you take out the inquiry that you printed, or if you go out right now, just find one that you're kind of interested in and, and then take your standards, either your one pagers, if you teach uh, K through eight or high school, it's pages 45 through 53. And I'm going to give you roughly five minutes to look through your inquiry and then highlight or just count up how many of the standards that you think are covered by doing that one inquiry. And then I'm going to have you guys type that total number of standards into the chat box for me. So it's roughly 406 right now. Um, so we'll let's touch back at like 412 and have you guys uh, start typing in the, the numbers that you have. And if you need help, just shout out in the chat box for me. I'm going to mute myself just in the meantime here. Yeah, if you want, you don't need to copy and paste the standards. If you just want to add up the total number and put them in the chat box, that would be that would be great. Um, the standards are on the uh, ADE website, depending upon the grade that you teach. Um, if you teach K through eight, they are under a uh, here. I'm going to paste it here in the chat box. Um, if you teach K through eight, they are under a tab called um, grades at a glance. And then what we've done is we've broken them out for just the grades so that way you don't have to necessarily look through all of them. And then the high school ones, we don't have a PDF just of the high school ones, but they, the main high school ones are just, you can look at the PDF of the main standards, but it's pages 45 to 53. So depending upon uh, what grades you teach, that's where you can find the standards and then just kind of count them up. Good, so we've got like 13, eight, nine, six to nine, 10 or more, seven, fantastic, 10. Yeah, easily eight. Eighteen. Way to go, Bruce. That's awesome. Ten. Fantastic. Eight. 
nine. Um, they provide the C3 lessons actually do provide you the resources. So they annotate them and give you the exact excerpts, uh, which are fantastic. It's, it's kind of like they're canned lessons that are easy, easy to do. Yeah, the nice thing is, so, you know, you think on a low end, maybe eight, on a high end, you can get as high as, you know, over 15, right? And that is the, uh, that's the beautiful part of it. And so this is what really makes inquiry so impactful or using these inquiry design model um, questions is that, so say you've done this one lesson or this one inquiry, you've hit maybe 10 or 12 of your standards, you do another one, some of those standards are going to overlap. And then you're going to do them, you know, again with another one. And so what happens, and this is what I've seen with my own kids, is that they get better and better and better at these skills and, and, and doing the work of historians. And I also found this to be really encouraging. So for the last, the last year that I taught before I went to, um, went to ADE, I taught in a majority minority school. It was title one. And my seventh hour was, uh, honestly, probably the most difficult class I had have ever taught in 20 years of teaching. And um, I would very lovingly refer to them as my sweat hogs, which is totally dating, dating me. Um, but they were just tough, tough kids that did not want to learn and didn't want to do the work of it because, oh, we've only been asked to regurgitate stuff in the past. Why aren't you, you know, you're making us do things. And it was amazing because just in getting them focused on this, one, they got interested in it. But then what was beautiful is in the spring semester, I could pass these things out and we would do all this kind of inquiry. And I would talk to the kids and I would say, do you guys realize that last August or September, you could not do this? You did not have the capability to sit and focus and actually do this kind of work. And they're like, oh yeah, you're right. We were really, we really couldn't do this. And it became like this source of pride with my, my sweat hogs that it's like, oh my gosh, we really did learn a lot and look at all the things that we've done um, by doing this. And, and it was that repeated pass and that doing it over and over and over again that's practice just like anything, you have to practice. You can't go out and try and ice skate and do some kind of flip without practicing, right? Um, and that's, that's what we get with this. And the kids just internalize it so much, so much more. All right, so th that's really the formal IDM or formal inquiries through the C3 framework. Um, I wanted to give you guys just some informal ways that you can get inquiry into your classes. So that way, again, we're getting kids thinking and getting those skills, especially, you know, as you maybe get the push as, as next year starts to maybe not teach social studies for those of you that are in elementary because you've got to make up from the ELA and math that was maybe missed from, from spring semester, really resist that and, and look at how you can use inquiry and one, it overlaps with ELA like nobody's business. We do a webinar on um, ELA and social studies and how to incorporate them, especially for an elementary level. And if you haven't taken that webinar, I highly recommend it. We have it again. Oh, when is it? July 23rd is when I'm offering it again. Um, and so that way you can, hey, I'm teaching ELA because I am teaching social studies and social studies is teaching reading. Um, but again, getting that inquiry and in, in developing those skills and processes. So again, this can be an anticipatory set. And again, I'm dating myself because so many people now call it battle work and warm ups and all that kind of stuff. But that's, that's what we called it when I, I started way back when. So anticipatory sets are great ways to add inquiry. A lot of times there's one um, from the Library of Congress on Lincoln pockets where I just would show kids five pictures um, that happened to be in Abraham Lincoln's pockets the night that he, he passed away. And, well, not passed away, he was shot. Um, 
and I don't tell the kids who they are. And so I show them one picture and I'm like, okay, what is this picture and who does it belong to? And then they make their guesses. And then I show them a second picture and it's like, okay, what's this picture? Who does it belong to? And how does it relate to the first picture? Then I show them a third picture, a fourth picture, a fifth picture. And again, they have to make their guesses. And it's fantastic because they, of course, never guess that they're Abraham Lincoln's, but then it gets that, get that really that kind of questioning about like, oh my gosh, well, why does he have a Confederate dollar, you know, Confederate money in his wallet and all this kind of stuff. And it's so much fun. And I've also adapted it and gone out to the Library of Congress where there are tons and tons of images. So for those of you that teach elementary, go out and it, it may seem daunting at first, but look and find, and there are all sorts of images out there to use as, for things like that for, for young kiddos. But even in high school and middle school, I use pictures all the time. Um, I did it for uh, a inter Japanese immigration. And so I looked at immigration in the 1880s and all the, um, or Chinese immigration, excuse me, all the Chinese that came over in the, you know, the mid 1800s and stuff and what immigration looked like. And I showed them pictures of what these immigrants would have. And then we talked about how immigrants changed over time and we quit allowing um, Chinese immigrants in and we started, you know, letting Filipinos come in to do agricultural work. And then we quit letting the Filipinos in. And so then we started using Mexicans for, uh, you know, agricultural work. And it was this great thing that all just started with like five pictures as an anticipatory set. Um, it can also be an exit ticket, which I've talked about the, the ranking thing that I do on the squares. Um, so anything like that. It can be an examination of the world around them where they're having to, again, think and ask questions of it. And then lastly, extending that learning past their scope, get them involved in the community in some way. Maybe there's a need that they see that you can do that. So real quick, I'm gonna show you just some other ways that I've used inquiry in my classes. And I use pie charts a lot. And I will give my students, um, and if you've attended maybe some of the other webinars, you might've seen this, um, given students uh, a basically an uneven pie chart. And I make them dole it out into, they have to put the, the pieces of the pie, pie chart into certain areas, but they have to just argue with evidence, okay, well, why did you give militarism the largest piece of the pie? Maybe these were, these are the four ca main causes of, of World War I. And so why do you think militarism is the main cause of World War I? Um, why is alliance the second cause? Um, and so then they have to back up what they're thinking with um, evidence. But again, it's just kind of a fun way. It's a visual way for your kids that are maybe more visual learners to really figure out, okay, well, what's more important and then back that up with, with evidence. Now, these are something that I love, love, love to do. And these are hexagons. So there are many hexagon generators that are free online. And so what I would do is go out and you just type in a whole bunch of vocabulary words. And so I would do this after we have done kind of a lesson. And I would use this as a, a summative to see if they got it. Um, and they have to type, it, type them out. I always would leave, you know, three, I don't know, two to three blank hexagons because inevitably I think I've got every vocab word that we've talked about in a lesson. And the kids will always say, well, what about this? Can we add this, this vocab word? Cause it fits right here. And I would cut these out or um, make my student aides cut them out or parents can cut them out. Right. And I would put them in little baggies and I would put them either in groups of two or maybe even groups of four. And they would get like 25 of these hexagons and they have to put them all together and they have to figure out what's in the middle and then piece them together. And in doing so, it was great because I could walk around the room and visually see if the kids are getting it or not. I'm not grading anything. I'm not, you know, taking a lot of time out of it. The kids are, um, not necessarily like making, you know, they're having to argue with each other about where they go and whatnot. And they make these really cool shapes and no group's shape ends up looking the same, which is also really fun. And so sometimes you can do like a gallery walk where the kids walk around and see other kids' hexagon shapes. Um, I've done it too, where I had the kids uh, have to put on a, a poster board and for teaching um, history, a lot of times I would tell the kids that we're going to use our pecs that we use, we, when we analyze civilizations, we would do things politically, economically, culturally, and socially. 
And so I would take that and say, okay, which of these hexagon items go under the political one, which go under the uh, economic range, which go under the cultural range, which go under the social range. And then they have to put those shapes together in each of those categories and then present it to the class kind of thing. So there are lots of cool, fun ways that you can use hexagons um, um, in class. And it also, the kids really, really enjoyed it as well. So here's kind of the art analysis. I want to show you guys what I, I do. So this is a picture actually from the Stanford History Education Group, which has got great resources for, I would say, middle school and, and high school. Um, and so this is a picture talking about, you know, from slave quarters. And a lot of times I just would give pictures. And again, when you're looking at this, just ask kids and even for younger kids, okay, what do you see what's going on? Um, many times I will then tell kids to divide it up into quadrants. Okay, what's going on in the top right, top left, and I would actually have them cover up the other quadrant so they focus just on the one, the one quadrant. And then another thing that I would do, and this is because I'm cheap and I don't want to be making copies all the time, is I would take these pictures, or say like I told you I did that picture of Guernica, and I would laminate it. And I would laminate it, or you could put it in a, a sheet protector, or I know the Oriental Trading Company sells like these clear plastic sleeves that, you know, you can get like 50 of them for, for I don't know, 10 bucks or something. Slide the picture in there and then use kind of those old-fashioned vis-a-vis markers for overheads and have kids annotate on that. And so then they're actually annotating like they would annotate a document, they're annotating a piece of art what's here, what's missing, what are these people doing, what do you notice about their homes, um, all of this kind of stuff. So again, they're writing and annotating a piece of art or a picture just like they would annotate a, a document, honestly. Um, and then I too would start the kids off sometimes by just kind of a hide and reveal sort of thing where I would just show the kids maybe on a overhead or something or in a PowerPoint and I'd show them, I'm like, okay, what's this a picture of and have them make guesses. What do you see? When did it take place? What happened? And then maybe just also reveal a piece of it and say, oh, okay, well now what do you think? When did this take place? What did this happen? You could do this as an anticipatory set. Again, this is inquiry, the kids are thinking, they're having to back up the evidence. So if we think, oh, okay, this is just a suburb, suburban home, well, what makes you think that? What evidence do you see in this picture that makes you think this is just a suburban home? You know, where in the United States is it? Okay, now how has that changed your, your, point, your point of view? What evidence do you have from this picture that says that this is from, you know, the South, okay? Um, and then, oh, well, this is, and then always, always ask them what's missing. What's missing? Where are the women? Where are the white people? You know, what's going on here? You know, and, and I think that's also just a great way to do, um, do inquiry. All right. So real quick, I wanted to show you guys, this is our professional development uh, website. So if you take your phones and you just pull it, and even if you don't have a QR code app on your phone, um, if you take your phones and open up the camera and kind of scan this, if you aren't able to do it now, you will get this when I send out the PDF of the presentation and you'll have it then, so don't, don't worry about it. But what this does is this takes you to a Wakelet and on that Wakelet, that then will have a link to a PDF that has um, all of our professional development out there. And that has... Um, the links to it because we at ADE do a lot of professional development that we offer but we also have partner organizations like the Arizona Council for Economic Education has great trainings both for um, high school middle school and secondary school or for elementary grades um, big history project and the OER project do great stuff for middle and high school um, and then also uh, things like street law and all that kind of stuff have it there and then I wanted to show you our website. So I'm actually gonna exit out of here and hopefully, let's see, I'm not sure. Let me see if you guys can, let's see. I'm just gonna stop sharing and then share my, here, let's go here. So I wanted to show you some things on our website here, which you guys have the, the link to. Uh, let me open up the chat again so I can see it. Um, so here I'd like, if you haven't subscribed to our newsletter, I highly recommend it. So from August until May, I put out a monthly newsletter that is K-12 with resources, tips, tricks, um, the latest pedagogy, technology, 
um, all different things for your classrooms that you can um, you get every month when we when we do that um, and then even we have them archived here so you know for example if it's Her uh, Hispanic Heritage Month uh, you can come back here and get resources here from so these are all the ones from 2019 2020 school year and if it's a little blurry just be patient my internet does that and it will um, kind of uh, clear up in a minute. We also have professional development websites. So here we have some of our recorded webinars that you can watch at your leisure if you wanna watch the social studies and elementary ELA one. Here's the inquiry one we just did or just basics on the standards. Uh, we also have little 10 minute videos on different things as well that, that work. Let me go back and then, um, so here are the implementation resources that we have for uh, K-8. So if you click here, um, what this is, is this will take you out to a PDF that has all of the course considerations, which these are your storylines. So if you scroll down, and hopefully it'll clear up here, um, it has all of these resources, the links to them, and a description for how to use those links in your classroom. So if you want books that you can buy to make an awesome library, the Notable Books is fantastic to get out and they do it every single year. And you can go back and look at past years and get stuff there. Arizona Geographic Alliance, especially for those of you that teach, um, well, honestly, I use them for high school and middle school. They have amazing resources and stuff out there. The C3 Teachers, Newzella, all that kind of stuff. So there are the um, implementation resources. High school, I've asked them to change it, but we're also in the process of changing um, our website, so it's gonna look a little different. If you go under resources, here I have them for civics, economics, world history, and US history. And so, like I said, I've taught all of these courses in seven through 12. I have used all of these resources. They are great. One thing I wanted to show you, and all of you, regardless of whether you teach high school or elementary school, is this resource here, Econ Ed Link, and I'll put it in the chat box as well, because it has amazing resources, wonderful lessons, but it has lots of stuff for those of you that are maybe not certified in Econ, and you feel nervous about teaching economics. Economics is so, so much fun to teach, let me tell you, but they have all this great stuff here for lessons by grade band. You can click up here by resources, by grade level. You can go by topic, and they have all of the resources there for you. St. Louis Fed is another good one. They, though, it's not St. Louis. The Federal Reserve Board has put it on, um, it's just federalreserveeducation.org. And this also, I use this lesson, these a lot too, and they have, k12 one so there's another link for that and you'll i'll send you guys um for that for to bookmark and so they've got fantastic resources uh to teach economics which now economics which having taught economics at the high school level i am so glad it's going to be taught in the lower levels because it is such an important thing to teach personal finance and all that kind of stuff um, but this is another great place to go for uh fantastic resources and then um so that's the econ. And then last thing I wanted to show you guys, because we've got like one minute left, uh, is the ELP and social studies crosswalk. So I have this for K-12. So these are great. So let me go to a different one. Let's go to fourth grade. So what I've done is I've taken all of the social studies standards for every grade level, and I've paired them with all of the ELA standards for that same grade level and the ELP standards, if you have English language proficiency or English language learners for those standards. Those, and then also a rationale for how you can use them in your classes. So this is great that if you do get that flack that, hey, you really shouldn't be teaching social studies, you need to be teaching ELA, you can say, I am. I'm teaching these disciplinary skills and processes, right, our SPs, but I'm also teaching reading. You know, I'm teaching writing and I'm teaching these other things. And so let me scroll down. So it's all, all here for you guys that you can, you can get that. So with that being said, let me go ahead and uh, have you very now at the last now, um, if you guys wouldn't mind, hopefully you're seeing this, to uh, the new, yes, they are the new ELP standards. Absolutely. Um, and they are listed in the presentation. Yes. 
So go ahead if you guys could just type your, your first and last names into the chat box so I have one last check for attendance. And again, this is not a perfect model, so occasionally I may miss someone, so just throw me an email um, that says, hey, I was there and, and I'll, I'll fix it. Um, and then within a week, I will send you guys um, a copy of the PDF and all of these resources in there and you will have them. And so again, please feel free. Um, you know, that's, this is my job, right? I'm, I'm here now to help you guys to serve you in any way that I can. Um, and if you need anything, if you can't find resources or you're stuck, uh, give me, give me an email. My email is there at lynda.burrows at azeb.gov or you can contact uh, Tammy Waller. She's also, she's the director of K-12 social studies. So thank you so much. Quick for question. Thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, can you tell me where that ELP crosswalk was in? I oh yeah, sure remember. thing. Yeah, let me, let me get out of here and I will thank show you. you. Yeah, sure thing. Can you see my screen okay? I don't know if you muted yourself. So hopefully you can see my screen. It's on I our- I muted myself. Okay. Oh, okay. So it's on our main social studies website. And if you scroll down, it's this tab here that says ELA SS ELP crosswalk. And oh, okay. So it, says, it says that it's the draft version, but they didn't change anything after I did this. So it is the most recent ELA standards from, what was it, 2016, I think. It is the most recent social studies standards from 2018. And then the most recent ELP standards that got approved last year. So everything is current and all out there for you guys to use to that way you can justify teaching, teaching social studies, right? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you guys so much for coming. I appreciate it. I appreciate your time. Take care, be safe, and uh, have a great uh, rest of your week and enjoy your summer. So I, I, miss, I miss having summer. <laughs> I am going to stop recording now.